will now open the floor for uh, question and answer. Since we are a, a you know, niche crowd, we perhaps don't, don't need enough regulation. Uh, so you can just raise your hand and we we'll pass the mic around and you can ask the question. So, anyone? Not to identify yourself. Yeah. My name is Kiran. Um, you said China was wondering how India feels about China, right? When you go inside, the, you know, the Mandarin speaking people or the, or the you know, Cantonese speaking, how do they really perceive India? Do they even think India is, you know, something as an important neighbor to think or their focus is mostly on US and it's more like a Bangladesh for them. How do they think of India? Okay, let me answer that in two separate ways. We see 1962 as a war. Chinese see it as a border scourge. Whenever I talk to Chinese, they say, what? War? Will it be what kind of war in India? The second part that is also very interesting is, they see a lot of cultural associations. After all, Buddhism originated here. You have a huge number of Chinese tourists who come for that Buddhist pilgrimage to India. So there is that connect. They, when they come here to understand the Buddhist culture, they automatically invite a lot of other Indian. Uh, <coughs> but the party, however, I think is gradually going around to the notion that perhaps India per se might not be a threat, but India combined with, let's say, the United States or some other big power does become a bit of an issue for them. So what they would like to see is, you know, the Chinese have this old colonial kind of a thing of subservience, the vassal states around them. They don't necessarily own them, but people pay their service to them. Pakistan is a prime example. So they are gradually veering around to seeing India not as a threat by itself. In fact, I remember seeing some rather sneering comments from the Chinese press when we launched um, what was that an ICBM recently, and you know our media said China killer and things like that. So a lot of you know uh, sneering going on in the Chinese media, saying India better not even dream of coming close to China, which is true if you look at the military expenses chart that I showed you. It's quite taken us a long time to get to even where China is. We don't even have those kind of resources. Down to sheer money. Having said that, however, it might be important to try and understand what the Chinese are doing in terms of asymmetrical warfare vis a vis the US. <coughs> that is a thing that we might also consider. Does that sort of answer your yeah. question? Yes. <coughs> My name is Ganesh. Yeah. I'd like to stress on the point number four that you made, where you said uh, India has actually been seen like more used by the West yes. than the Chinese. Actually, it seems to be more evident, especially going by the media reports that we keep getting. They seem to be pushing more on the strategic tension that prevails between India and China. It seems more like a selling the news for the people so that, you know, there is always that sense of distrust between Indians and Chinese, especially from the Indian side. Yes. Uh, the second thing is, uh, uh, how do we uh, correct the trust factor? Is it only by saying that, yes, as a civilization, as a very old civilization, India is quite unique and uh, China has a lot of similarities with regards to civilization. But we going too much and leaning on the West, uh, I think, Give a lot of confused signals, but that's my... Uh... Let, me, let me put it another way. The rise of India, the Chinese don't just see it as a strategic threat. What they worry about is that here are two conflicting ideologies, a closed communist state and an open democracy. So if India were to somehow start expanding, the Chinese fear that their influence would start declining. So they worry about that. They don't want you know, communism the way they see it. Take a hit just because a neighbor is doing better because it's democratic. They keep staring at us. They, you know, I remember somebody saying, you know, in your country you have cows walking the roads, you know, you know, people are dying on the streets, and yet you call yourself a superpower. It's a 
just because you have a couple of new plebiscites. So there is that condescension at some level. But at the same time, there is the fear that you know, if a democracy starts overtaking and a democracy that's in the neighborhood, it undermines their sort of insular communist structure. That is a very valid fear that they have. So my concern is simply my antenna go up the moment I hear that we are being used. I really resent that. You know, the, the phrase that is going around is that India is being used as the come to make the challenge by the Americans or by the West. I think we are far too big to be really used by anybody. Okay. B, I don't think we need to necessarily stress on that and say, hey, you can't touch me because the Americans are watching my back. Because tomorrow the Americans might not. In fact, I would say that the Americans are in many ways actually trying to use us <coughs> fire over our shoulders. I don't think we should buy into that argument much. It's good to use the Americans to get your you know, moral support from international support. You know, the only superpower. You don't want to rub it the wrong way, but at the same time, you don't want to be seen as somebody being used. That's my personal opinion. So if we remove that from the equation, I feel that it would make bilateral relations of you know, the dialogue that we have with China that much easier. The media isn't doing a great job right now. Isn't it? I think there is a lack of understanding because you know, having been in the media for a long time, I also know that it is very easy to use the media for your own thing. If 20 people come to you and say, you know, the Americans are using us to come to it. <laughs> people will start writing that. And when you start writing that, others will pick it up and say the same thing. And then it starts becoming the truth. So it is important that we clarify that that is not our vision. That we are not here to be the counterweight to anybody. Secondly, uh, how, how much of uh, communism ideology still uh, remains in China? In the sense, they are going back to that confusion. As a, as a party, they are communist. As a country, they have become purely capitalist now. <laughs> In terms of the economy, they are opening up. I think 75 percent of the economy is opened up. With regard, yeah, even so, that itself is also causing a lot of stress and strain within China. But uh, I think they will be able to handle it. You see, an interesting part of China's thinking. Uh, and I, the man I mentioned earlier, he had come to uh, Bombay once for an Asia Society conference. And he said that whoever said that the Western idea of democracy is the best system there is, we in China believe that you know we need to uplift our people first. We need to give them food, we need to give them water, we need to give them housing, clothes, a livelihood. And then we will think about democracy and the right to elect your own government. That's the Chinese you know, version of it. I may or may not agree with that. But it doesn't necessarily always mean that, you know. The way we practice democracy is the best. It, it's their philosophy. I personally don't think that we should get into that argument with them. Let's not walk down that line with them that you know, we are a democracy, so we're better than you. It doesn't work like that. Let them have their own culture as long as it does not interfere with us, as long as it does not pose a threat to our own interest. I don't see any reason why the country would exist in that sense. Yes? Yes, follow there and then. Uh, uh, long back I read a book it was uh, written by Lawrence Kuhn uh, it was about uh, China and uh, it was actually a biography of John uh, Lai no not John Lai who was the other uh, general, general secretary um, in, the, in the late 80s Jen 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 the man who changed China very fine book. In that, he narrates an incident where uh, the Chinese airliner was shot, was shot down by by the U.S. Navy. That's right. So, you know, he narrates and he discusses the internal goings on here within the Chinese government and the fact that uh, Jiang Zemin had a personal call with the with the president, with the U.S. president at that time. I think it was Clinton, and uh, the conversation is something like, you know, there is a popular uprising in China, 
where people are educated and they are surrounded the, uh, the, the uh, roads uh, leading to the U.S. Embassy and they would, they would if they could, they would burn it down. Uh, and, and here, uh, the gentleman is saying that, you know, we would like to control these crowds, but we cannot. They are urging us on. They want us to take tough action. So what I want you to do is, I want you to issue a public apology. That's right, and you got it. Right? So, what, what that uh, tells me is that here we tend to exaggerate the differences between the Chinese people and their government. We take Tiananmen Square as, as a prime illustration of the fact that there could be a people's uprising and they could overthrow their government. And it's, I, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's not so simple. I believe the Chinese are inherently extremely patriotic and nationalistic. Absolutely. And many a times they are more extreme than their own government where the government would like to be diplomatic, they would not like their government to be as diplomatic as the government would, given a given choice. That's one. Uh, secondly, we, you discussed uh, the, the psyche of our people or our government versus the psyche of the Chinese people, the I Chinese say, government. Yes, I would say government, I would say people, the people, cultural, cultural psyche. So, in terms of your force projection or power projection, uh, I believe the Chinese are able to do that because they have a civilizational center of gravity. We are not able to do that because we don't know where our center of gravity is today in terms of civilization. We are all over the place, whereas the Chinese are very clear as to what they want 25 years down the line, 50 years down the line, they have already advanced. If there, if there was a famous saying, you know, if, if uh, the U.S. or the USSR at that time thought 10 years ahead, the Chinese thought 100 years ahead. That's right. So they can say, this practice are there, so Taiwan is never going to be anywhere else, but we'll come back to them. They already have Hong Kong and Macau and various other you know, islands. We don't have that language. Uh, we, it's not to say that we never had that language, but it's more to say that we don't, we've lost that language in terms of not being able to grasp it anymore. So, for example, if you translate it in our uh, discourse, it would be a couple of days down the line, a couple of decades down the line, we will be, we, we will have Bangladesh back, or we will have Pakistan back, or we will have some sort of a closer brotherly ties or, or closer administrative ties with Sri Lanka or Nepal. That would be our discourse. And then we would be able to inform our outer boundaries. Uh, I believe that it was Lala Hardaya long back who had said that our foreign policy or our force projection should lie somewhere near Africa and not somewhere near our shores. So if I remember it rightly. So we've lost that language. So my question to you is, number one, how can we hope to face off with China? And even today, uh, our <coughs> actions are more reactive and Chinese are more proactive. So we are reacting to everything that China does. Whereas Chinese are, are playing their game very well on the chessboard. That's one. How, how can we regain that language? Uh, so let, let, me, let me stop there. Okay. Let me you know, break up your question. Number one, you spoke about riots over the shooting down. China, or the government of China, uses this people geography very well. In fact, the way I see it, they use the historical differences they have with Japan, for instance, by occasionally fomenting anti-Japan riots, thereby allowing people to let off steam in many ways. When you have a 
insular system, there is always a lot of bubbling going on. So every now and then it is good to get them all together and say, you know, these guys are after us, let's go get them. It is a well thought out process. And then you use those riots in turn to get concessions from the people you are aiming at. So it, it is not something spontaneous, it is something that is planned. You cannot have a really a riot riot in China in that sense without the government sort of being involved in some way. That's one part of it. Uh, the second part of it is that, you know, I always believe that foreign policy or any national policy in the world is not limited to, it's not an individual policy. It has to apply to everybody. What I think is foreign policy, not necessarily what is good for India. It has to be good for everybody else. And in the process, in the process, there might be a few who feel ignored or who feel, I mean, in the US you have these special groups. In India too, we have very powerful special groups. But for a government, as in our government, we seem to be always coming down to even, you know, a guy on the street saying something that I will not let this happen and it becomes a national issue. We shouldn't let that happen. Foreign policy is not about individual reactions or individual morals or scruples. Foreign policy has to be built on far stronger stuff. It has to be in the national interest. Which is why I'm also, you know, keen to understand that what are our core national interests? I don't think we have defined it as yet. I don't, if you ask anybody here, can somebody here tell me what constitutes our core national interest? We don't, but the Chinese are very, very clear. Territorial and sovereign rights don't mess with us. I think we can, but but it's a uh, very, very impolitic or politically incorrect to speak about our national interests with great clarity today. Or is it because we are mostly governed by lawyers and they are governed by engineers? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let, let me come back to you from another perspective. What China would have done in a case like ours? They would have raised a huge issue over a non-existent, made an issue out of something really large, large issue out of something that really doesn't exist because they know it's not going to happen. And why people are sort of getting agitated over that, they would go ahead and do what they were originally trying to do. It's that it's a spillover from that thing that if I want the one, so let me claim Arunachal. That's the way they treat their own people. I want something done, let me first distract them by talking about a much larger issue. And why people are getting agitated over that, we go ahead, I mean, I personally thought that when perhaps when the BJP was in power here, they could have done that to a great degree when it came to Kashmir. Article 371, I mean, they had promised that it would be repeat, but they couldn't. So the trick at that time would have been to raise a much larger body somewhere and then quietly get this done because once it's done, it's done. But we haven't yet mastered that and I think we need to learn that from the Chinese. Anyways, that's, that's, you know, Sun Tzu and the art of war. We have uh, Chanakya, but Chanakya sadly enough in India has started taking negative overtones. Whereas in China, like I said, you know, they think deception is fine. Deception is, should be part of our foreign policy, of our strategic culture. That there's a fundamental disconnect. We would be very uncomfortable. In fact, most countries would be somewhat uncomfortable with putting off deception in that sense. But for the Chinese, it's, it's, it's not even a moral issue. I mean, they'd be really surprised if you told them that you betrayed us. They would say, let's, obviously, I mean, you got betrayed, that's your problem. <laughs> Our job is done. So that's the other part of it. Um, the chairman here. Yeah. I'm more like that. Two years back, I heard an uh, economist from China. He was telling, uh, I don't know how much statistics we can rely uh, because you also know how much what comes out of China uh, is yes. uh, normally it is sweetened for the world. But it, this was in Singapore. So I thought there may be some uh, less sweetened than that. He was telling, they have lot of problems in the 2022 onwards. 
the first is aging problem he was telling. Mm -hmm. Chinese population will be having around 60% aged population, which will uh, not only reduce its economic effectiveness, and it will have telling effects on the uh, cohesion for the benefits to the, them. So they are not able to uh, make the plans for that. That's one thing. Second thing, if you see economically, they are spending less generally. So that's why they are able to give loan to US. And uh, the effects with the US coming down in economically will be very, very uh, harsh on China. Oh yes, yes. So, that, uh, and we have that opportunity now because India's aging population is less, working population will be more uh, another 5 10 years. And that will be a very good uh, opportunity for India to be the world leader for 30 35 years. That's what, that is the, I mean, a lot of economic research they have done. And this also proves that uh, China is not able to uh, cater to the other world except in manufacturing. Skill set, yes. India is better. Then uh, ideas, India is better. Except where manufacturing, if a piece of this uh, uh, unit has to be done, uh, uh, one crore, two crores, so people will go to China from any other corner. But if some software or chip has to be embedded to make this work, they, have, they come into India. I have friends telling like this. So I feel we should keep cool as you told with China and do our work. We will be able to succeed. Uh, let, me, let me add to what you just said. What you're describing is something we call the demographic dividend as far as India is concerned, that we have a pool of youngsters. My challenge there is, when these youngsters enter the workforce, do we have to work for them? We are, you know, producing thousands and thousands of graduates each year. Each year. <coughs> How many of them are actually getting employed? I understand the Chinese problem, that they find it difficult to look after the elderly because this number of elderly are going larger every day. And then, but they recently, I think they're aware of this problem, because they recently uh, discontinued that one-child policy very recently they announced that they don't want to stick with that one-child policy. So they are aware that this is an issue and like you said, and they're trying to correct it. But we keep talking about this demographic dividend that we have a huge workforce. The problem is, where's the work? You know, it's, it is no problem having a massive workforce if they're going to get frustrated and not be able to earn a living. So it is important that we build that infrastructure first. And that can only come when you invest hugely in things like infrastructure. Because you know, starting right from the engineering part of it to the labor part of it, that's where you're going to get employment from. And that cannot be done without state intervention because of the huge sums in It cannot be a private venture because the payoffs are much later and you, know, you never know when you're going to get it. So that's part of the thing. I would say that what the Americans are saying, that the Pacific is big enough for both of us, I would, you know, argue that India should keep on stressing on the fact that the world is big enough for both of us. Having said that, however, part of Chinese strategic thinking has always been that it is better to keep the opponent on the back foot and perpetually kissing about my intentions. If I'm going to tell you that, you know, this is Indo-China friendship here and at the same time I'm going to have incursions into your, into your country, which one should I be? So it is important for us to understand that this is part of their policy and then figure out ways to work around it. And then convince them that you don't really need to, you know, cross the border to keep me on my back. Because I know that that's a technique to use. And at the same time you should be able to Repulse them, or at least have the strength to do something. I think in the early 80s, uh, no, yeah, late 80s, early 90s, General Sundarji, I think, was chief of army staff. You know, the Chinese had put in an incursion into. Yeah, we were begging and pleading with them, and they had occupied a bridge somewhere in the Tawang sector. The government 
didn't quite know how to respond. General Sundarji, however, said, no, if they have occupied that bridge, I want people on the next bridge. I want to put my people there. And he's put his forces there. So there was this valley, and you had two forces facing off. The Chinese, when they met at the official level, they said, oh, you people talk about peace, but you are making <coughs> military moves in the border. So then the Indians said, okay, you know, you put people there, we put people here. You climb down that mountain, you climb back from there. <coughs> the whole tone changed in the interaction after that because they realized that we had, in some way, outsmarted them. And it's not that the Chinese, I think the entire world respects strength. And it's not just perceived strength, it's you know, the ability to actually use it. This, you know, this Pakistani philosophy of a thousand cuts stems from the fact that, you know, every time push comes to shove, India has bricked. We have amassed thousands and thousands of troops on the border of Pakistan and then pulled them back. During the Kargil time, we didn't cross the border. We could, it, it would have been over in a day if we had done that. But it took Bill Clinton to come in and say, you know, tell us that, hey, they are the nuclear saber, so be careful. So, it is important that we change our mindset and act like a strong power. I don't think we do that. I think we are still stuck with you know non-alignment and you know the underprivileged and we should move with them and the you know the underdog is my friend. If we are a great power, we must be very proud like that. I don't see that happening very soon. Regardless of whichever government comes to power, I don't really see that happening because it's part of our culture. We also believe that we are large enough to, you know, uh, live with whatever Pakistan throws at us in terms of terrorist attacks and other things that, okay, a few hundred people died in a population of 1.2 billion, so what? So, that only encourages others. That, you know, in India, if I get out of the street and start a protest, everybody will pay attention. In China, you'll be shut down. Strength has to be understood both internally and externally. But we must be able to project that thing, and we must be seen as being able to project that power. Like I explained just now with this great joke in chapter two, uh, in the sense, strategically speaking, you always prefer the devil further away to the one nearer to you. For example, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, in South America. I wouldn't call it a dissent, but there is a sort of dedication to the way the United States has treated it. And therefore, you see a lot of real estate being bought up by China, very willing to in Panama, in Costa Rica, etc. That same sort of willingness to flirt with the devil further away, I don't see in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in uh, Taiwan, in Japan. The American pivot has failed for the simple reason that there are no regional alliances to cement such uh, an initiative from the US. <coughs> what is it that makes um, China's backyard more hesitant to flirt with America for its own benefits than, say, the American backyard to flirt with China for their benefits? I think you see, what you're describing is something that is known as the Big Brother Syndrome. This is part of that culture. But, you know, you go to the Philippines and you start telling them that, look, we do this or else. Even when I'm doing something good for them, there is that thing coming in. At the same time, the region has always been somewhat suspicious of American intentions. They believe that America too, the US would be willing to use force. If not, I think they would be happy to. But in a way, they'd be forced to go into the Chinese sort of sphere of influence. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Suman. Uh, Pakistan's interest in friendship with China is quite understandable. But what is China's interest in friendship with Pakistan? How do they perceive Pakistan? Uh, do they see Pakistan as an enemy's enemy, thereby a friend? Or do they do it otherwise? What is your take on that? There are two aspects there. 
one strategically. They have seen the way that the US has used Pakistan. They believe that getting actively involved in Pakistan and you know, making it part of their own circle gives them strategic depth in various ways. For us, it opens up two fronts. They are now there in Delhi, Pakistan. And these people who are actually doing, building the infrastructure there are all PLA in China. It's the army that does the mixed roads. It's like we have the border roads organization. China, it's, they're all trained soldiers. They're there helping build the infrastructure in Delhi, Pakistan. So, if there is actually a clash, we'd have to worry about this border and this border, number one. Number two, by stressing on the fact that, you know, India and Pakistan are perpetually fighting against each other. And at a subliminal level, it keeps us all in a regional grouping. Our aspirations to go beyond that are curtailed by the fact that, you know, they're seen as, oh, these guys are always fighting against each other. How can they be put into the world's top table? So that is the long tail philosophy behind it. Of course, there are other interests. What are court? Incidentally, so sale of their military equipment. Sorry? Sale of their military equipment. Market for their military equipment. Yes. Then, of course, um, Iranian oil. Sorry? Iranian oil. Oil to, to an extent. Plus, of course, you know, that Aksai Chin area and the area which they now have gives them a direct road access to Xinjiang province, which they didn't have earlier. They would have had to cross over Tibet and go into that, that area. Now they have access through that uh, place. However, let me also say that off late, off late, there has been Chinese concern over the way Pakistan is going. I'm told that, you know, you have unrest in Xinjiang, which is essentially a Muslim uprising. I'm told that a lot of Pakistani clerics were involved and the Chinese know about it. But six, seven years ago, the, the way the Chinese deal with it is that they identify some of these clerics who are involved, invite them over to China for a talk. And this is a private invitation. Once you're there, you don't come back. I believe this has happened once, after which even you know the Muslim clergy have been a bit wary about visiting China. <laughs> but there is increasing understanding that the Chinese are trying to sort of balance the two and say that look, why not get strategic depth by aligning with Pakistan? At the same time, my economic ties with India. And like I said, we are about to hit a I mean hit a hundred billion dollars. We're a huge market. For so, if the trade takes a hit just because of the ties with Pakistan, there is a bit of there is a bit of uh, division, for want of a better word, happening on what Pakistan is doing and where it is going. But the other part that the Chinese find Pakistan very really useful is that what happens is Pakistan gets a lot of American military hardware, which in turn is picked up by the Chinese for reverse engineering. helping them produce their own, which in turn also apparently goes to Russia. <coughs> because there's a big uh, Sino-Russian defense understanding. A lot of their defense equipment comes from Russia. <coughs> That's another area where we need to watch out for because, you know, our relationship with Russia is <coughs> starting to get on somewhat shaky ground, despite all our cultural ties and whatever. And if Russia and China were to actually formally team up, they would still be a, you know, they could make the two nuclear powers standing up against us. It's not something that, I mean, but I understand that our uh, foreign affairs people are aware that this is a thing and we are trying to, you know, ensure that they don't sort of gang up against us. But the Russians are starting to resent the fact that we are not no longer totally dependent on them for our military hardware, that we are picking up things from the U.S., picking up things from elsewhere. Recently, you know, they were very sure that we would be buying aircraft from there, helicopters from there. 
for them as big market and enough. They buy it from the Americans, they buy it from the Europeans. So when they see that building, there might be some resentment, which in turn might spill over into the relationship that we have, but it's not happened yet, but I worry that it could be a possibility. Thank you. So we'll have the last question for the evening there. Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, it was a statement you were telling that uh, uh, China is actually a uh, superpower. And one of the, no, carry on. Uh, one of the methods uh, to become a superpower super is to get economically powerful. Yes. So you are telling that uh, India is having right now $75 billion trade with them and uh, very in the future uh, it will become $100 billion. Yes. So uh, how it is justified that uh, China is, uh, is a strategic threat to India and India knowing that one and still giving money to them and in fact China is using the same money to threaten us. I'm sorry, can you just repeat that again? Sir? China is becoming yes. economically powerful Yes. and India is also contributing the, to, uh, to China to become powerful right. by having a very big amount of trade with them. Yes. So, and China is using the same money to threaten us. Means it has become a strategic threat to conflict India. of interest. Uh, let, let me explain that in another way. This is part of, let's say, the way the Americans are thinking, that we need to engage. It can't always be confrontational. The belief there is that if we have very strong trading ties, any sort of, you know, warlike movements on either side would impact that, on both sides. So it is seen as part of a try to ensure that to ease friction. If we have a hundred billion dollars worth of trade every year in China, we would like to believe that that influences them against. I mean, it would impact them if we had a war. They would be hit too. However, I mean, you must also look at the other way around that we are talking hundred billion trade with the US is seven hundred something billion. So 100 billion is not that big a number in that sense. But for us, yes, it's a big thing. So it's, it's, a, it's a strategic trade-off that we believe that you know the more China gets involved in various international institutions, the less likely it is going to be to sort of attack those institutions because it benefits them as well. So I think those institutions would impact them as well. That is the thinking that is culminated. I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong, but that is the that is why we are building up trade ties with China. Yeah. Uh, last question here on this exercise. Is there any sort of environmental threat from the China is building, uh, means the infra from the infra infrastructure that China is building uh, along our border? From what little I understand, China doesn't give a sweet solitary damn about the ecology. <coughs> they want something done, they do it. You know this, this river system that they're building where they're diverting water going back into the mainland, you actually going to have a system where one river goes underneath another. It's, it's not something that's easily doable, but they're, they're planning that. And they don't care if India doesn't get water. In many ways, they say, so what? We need, you know, water is going to be a very critical issue in our relationship. It's why I'm keeping on saying that we need to ensure that we have some kind of a treaty with them. But China doesn't believe it. China believes that, you know, if it's in my territory, it's my water. I can do whatever I want. I don't care what happens on stream. See, we had a similar kind of a system, let's say, with Bangladesh a long time ago, with the Farakka barrage. We never said it, but the Bangladeshis knew that we could either flood them or turn them into a desert simply by operating the walls of their barrage. Which they resented, but they didn't know how to react. They kept on harping for, you know, water treaties and things. We do have a water treaty with them, but that's also a very strange treaty that we had with them. I think uh, Ake Gujral that we must be nice to all our neighbors. And so we, the water treaty that we had at that time with Bangladesh <coughs> guaranteed water to them at a particular time, at a particular level, that you know, during the monsoons will give you so much, during the dry season will give you so much. Unfortunately, the basis of the argument of how much water there was in the river system was about 50 years old, the data. After having signed this agreement, we realized that if we were to actually give <coughs> Bangladesh the water that we promised them, Calcutta port would sit up. 
you just, you know, since, <laughs> since that time, the first measurements were taken here at UPE, we've had lots and lots of irrigation projects in UPE and here and there, so the water level has declined dramatically. But we are looking at volumes which are 40 years old, which was much more in those days. So then we tried to renegotiate, but the Bangladesh nations are saying, hey, you guys have signed. I think it's now before the World Court or something, but basically we're trying to renegotiate again. But those things are something we need to watch out for. But on the other side, the other side, we have the Indus Water Treaty with Pakistan, which we have not reneged on even during times of war. Of course, it's easy to say, you know, we can use water as a weapon, but it isn't that easy to divert water or take away water from a, from a river. At best, you can dam it, and making building a dam takes time. So, the Indus Water Treaty has held despite all these wars that we've had in Pakistan. In fact, I remember, I think, in the, in the 1971 war. While the war was happening, we actually had a meeting of the Indus Water Commission in Bombay. <laughs> so, a similar arrangement needs to be made with China. And we are guaranteed because we are lower agrarian. I mean, internationally, that's a law. That people downstream should be guaranteed. You have no business cutting off somebody else's water if your river is going into their territory. But the Chinese are not willing to accept that right now. In fact, they believe that a lot of these international treaties are biased in favor of the West. So they would like to rework those to ensure that their interests are also met some of these things. And like, ecologically, like I said, they don't give a damn. But there is a I mean, global warming? Then it happens, we'll see. And second question last. How do you read Dr. Manmohan Singh foreign policy in to China? Does he have a phone policy? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, it's, it's a question. Do we have a phone policy? We have economic policies, we have no social policies. But we have uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Singh. It's a very enlightening uh, talk. <laughs> wants to be seen as a superpower starts acting like one Absolutely. and uh, that's the message that needs to go out and hopefully those who are watching us online uh, you know uh, will perhaps also concur with the uh, gist of the talk here uh, and uh, it was an absolute uh, you know, delight to have you here and talk to us about uh, or demystify China in such a lucid manner so thank you so much Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we close for the evening, I'll request uh, Professor Butter to say a few words. Uh, sir. Thanks, Sir Ox. So, would you like to go there or would you like to use that mic? Taking into consideration our historical relations with those countries are also 
I think uh, we have not deliberated on them uh, as uh, uh, much as we should have done. Therefore, there are uh, many incomes uh, kind of very confused uh, statements and efforts to deal with various different situations that occur between the countries and all that. Uh, we have heard him, he is an expert in that subject and I am not and therefore I not want to make any more comments on what he has uh, just uh, spoken to us. But anyway, he has uh, brought some uh, new, th thrown some new light on this uh, subject and made us to know many new things about China and what is the situation there and how <coughs> the government should have taken note of all these things, what should have been our policy and I think it uh, gives us a clue into this subject and I thank him for the enlightened uh, uh, talk that has given to us. Uh, Jignasa is an effort not only to discuss and deliberate upon the various different issues confronting us, whether it is with regard to our economic policies, social policies, foreign relations, or problems related to governments. And uh, we want to gradually awaken the people with regard to these things and uh, enlighten uh, say approach to the various problems that uh, surround us and uh, <coughs> gradually over the last uh, few months we uh, had several such activities, several lectures also and I would like to see that this will gradually develop into a sort of an intellectual movement. Uh, not only we attend to these uh, arranged lectures and attend to them, gradually it will uh, lead to a wider debate through the media and gradually we will be able to educate the public also and enable the public to formulate a clear understanding of these various problems whether they are internal or external. So, uh, we uh, need to make some more efforts to see that we will be able to reach out to a larger audience and uh, from this point of view I would uh, make an appeal to all of you not only to make personal contact and see that in future programs we will be able to gather uh, a bigger number gradually it should be able to lead to a enlightened intellectual debate on all these different matters related to our national life. And uh, on behalf of Tignasa, I express my heartfelt thanks to the learned speaker who has enlightened us on this uh, There is no reason for me to deliberate any more, dilate any more on, on this subject. And with these words, I thank the speaker and also everyone of you who is present. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a little announcement. Uh, middle of December, we will have a internal format discussion called Charcha. We will notify you of the topic and the speaker. You can follow us on uh, social media, which is Facebook and Twitter, to be updated on everything that is happening, so that uh, uh, you know you can connect with us as and when we have the program. Thanks for coming here, and thanks for being such a lovely, engaging audience. We really enjoyed the discussion, and I hope uh, Mr. Senupta has had a good evening as well, and hopefully he will uh, address us. Again.